What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of The Sit Down. As always, if you enjoy this video and you're watching us on YouTube, make sure you hit the like button and let me know what you think of the discussion in the comment section below. If you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet, or you're living on a rock and seeing this video for the first time, I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit that subscribe button below now so you never miss another sit down video. If you're checking us out currently on our audio platform on Google Pods, Spotify, or iTunes, welcome in. I hope you enjoy the show. Do me a favor and make sure you leave us a detailed review and rating, letting us know what you think of the show. We are back, ladies and gentlemen, with episode 106 of the Sit Down, a crime history podcast. And we are, as always, presented by Barstool Sports. I am your host, Jeff Nadu. And I got to tell you, I'm excited, as always, about this week's show. You know, this week I had considered several ideas for the show. You know, I'm always thinking about ways to go a different way with the show. But I have to admit, there's been a show I've been wanting to do for a while. I get DMs all the time about this. Hey, you know, do a show on the Albanians in the Bronx. And I, I, I've, I've wanted to do it, and I feel like today I'm going to do it. Last week we discussed another Albanian, John A. Light, and that show was well-received. You know, whether or not you like John A. Light, people enjoyed the show. It did pretty well. Today we're going to get into a more ruthless group of individuals and ones that, I have to admit, pushed the mafia at some points. Um, I think in the end, though, what you would find about the Albanians that uh, ran things in the early 2000s, people like Alex Ruda, I think what we would ultimately find out is that they definitely made some moves. They made some money for sure. They definitely fringed upon three different crime families, the Bonanos, the Lucchese's, and the Gambinos. But I think in the end, as the Lucchese said, I think they were just a little bit too big for their britches. You know, and interestingly enough, they never actually went at the real money. And I'm talking about the big boys in the Bronx, right? Uh, the the Lacasios, you know, the Artusos, you know, some of the, the names that we know from history. It seems like the Albanians always knew when to pick on the right people. They made some money. They definitely caused some shit in the Bronx and in Westchester and in Queens. But in the end, they were just a group of marauders that, you know, are in prison for a long time. So we're going to get into them. We're going to get into their kind of nucleus. We're going to get into the kind of the history of where these guys come from. And I think there needs to be a distinction here. And I want to make this clear as we get into this show. This is about the Rudai organization, something they would call the sixth family. This is not about the Albanian mafia in Europe, uh, which is very powerful. Um, we may do a show at some point on that group, but this is really just on the Rudai organization. You know, Alex Rudai, Lenny Kaladi, Nicola Dedai, Frankie Evazai, those kind of guys. Um, and I think I can kind of give you an interesting glimpse because, you know, I think the Albanian communities in New York are quite interesting. And I feel like to me, a lot of these guys represent, I think, kind of the old school gangster, right? They grew up, whether it's in poverty or in communism, and they wanted something else. You know, they didn't like the authority. They didn't like the establishment. So they go out and they start committing crimes and they want it. They take it. The story of Alex Rudai and the group they call the Corporation. Let's get into it here on the sit down. Alex Rudai was born in 1967, and he's actually an ethnic Albanian. Uh, he's an ethnic Albanian, but he would grow up in Alshinj, which is a town in southern Montenegro, not far from the border of Albania. If you notice here on the map, if you're watching us on YouTube, um, you know, this area is very close to Shkoder, uh, which is in northern Albania. This is actually a beautiful town, um, the town that Alex Rudai is from. And it's said that Alex Rudai was actually from a pretty prominent family, supposedly, in Montenegro. Now, there's not a lot of information known on that family. But from what I understand in the Balkan community, they were pretty powerful as far as I know. It's unclear as to why Alex Rudai left uh, Montenegro. Um and if you know anything about Southern Montenegro, it is made up mostly of ethnic Albanians. I do believe 80% of the town that 
Alex Ruda is from is ethnically, ethnically Albanian. So, you know, when you go to the Balkans, it's very confusing because you'll have ethnic Albanians living in Greece. You have Greeks that are Albanians that live in Albania, like all sorts of, of different people live in different areas. Now, one thing that maybe a lot of people don't know about New York is that Albanians make up at this point, particularly in the Bronx, a huge part of the population. I saw recently over the last, I think, two or so years, one third of the apartment buildings in the Bronx are owned by Albanians. The Albanians make up a huge population in the Bronx. And essentially in 1987, Alex Rudai makes his way to New York City. Um, and at 19, he kind of sees, hey, you know, I can go over to, to New York. We already have plenty of Albanians over there. They're starting to make their way into the Bronx. Um, and this is before a lot of the influx would come in. Um, you look at today in New York, it said that there are about 60,000 Albanians living in the Bronx, Westchester, um, just all around New York City, Queens, Brooklyn, Staten Island. Uh, there's a lot of Albanians at this point in New York. And if you've ever been to certain areas of the Bronx, Pelham Parkway, uh, the area like Leidig Avenue, Holland Avenue, Barnes Avenue, all Albanian, right? You got Burek places, you've got ca cafes, you got all sorts of stuff. Arthur Avenue, Mars Park, a lot of Albanians up there now. And this is kind of the fertile area where Alex Rudai starts to kind of understand the lay of the land. Now, as we know in the Bronx, it is mob controlled as well. You know that there are three particular families. In fact, all the families are around, but you look at the three families that we know about, that we've seen recently in the Bronx. Lucchese crime family, right? You got Stephen Crea, those guys, they all run out of the Bronx. Uh, the Bonanos, Vinny Basciano, Dominic Sakali, you know, Michael Mancuso. Look at the Gambinos, the Artusos, the Lacasios, you know, um, Zef Mustafa was up that way. Um, you know, you, you, have, you have a long, rich history with some of these families in these areas. And you look at Rudai. He's starting to sow the seeds because he's making his own connections. It's said that early in his life, Alex Ruda was actually in a, a Gambino associate alongside a person called Nardino Calati, a.k.a. Lenny. Now, Lenny was an Italian who was very close with a soldier in the Gambino crime family, a guy called Philip Skinny Phil Loscalzo. Loscalzo goes way back. He was mentioned on wiretaps with John Gotti. He was a soldier up there uh, in uh, Tommy Gambino's crew, supposedly, up in that area. And you know, he's making money gambling, loan sharking, extortion. And Kaladi has multiple cafes um, that are housing not only his own gambling machines, but gambling machines. Kaladi was big into gambling. And the thought for Kaladi was down the road, he was doing enough to be made by the Gambino crime family. That was his ultimate goal, right? The problem was during the early 90s, he and Rudai kind of start talking together. They start sowing the seeds that Kaladi's unhappy. Rudai knows he's never going to become a made member of the mafia. And they decide, well, maybe we'll just start doing our own thing. So one thing they start doing is they start shaking down certain people doing criminal things in the Bronx. Most notably, people connected with organized crime. And one of the people they start shaking down is a guy called Guy Paduto, Gaetano Paduto. He's an associate of Vinny Basciano. This guy Paduto is stealing cars, right? And he's involved with this car theft ring. It's alleged that the Baduto ring was bringing in about $20 million a year in stolen cars. So, again, we look at Vinny Bastiano's vast empire, and it's all little groups of people submitting money to him. And this guy's under him. He wants to make sure that, you know, his investments are protected. So Vinny Bastiano essentially tells the Albanian Rudai and Kaladi that, you know, they need to bug off. At one point, it's alleged that Bassiano sent two individuals with machine guns at Rudai and Kaladi. Now, this would set off eventually uh, Rudai as well as Kaladi allegedly uh, engaged in some sort of high-speed car chase with Peduto. And from what I understand, this was never proven in court. They beat the rap on this, but supposedly Rudai was hanging out of the windshield or hanging out of the sunroof 
spraying, attempting to spray the car. So these guys are wild, man. Like they're going at people. They're starting to, to, to infringe on territory. And this is only the beginning of kind of some of the terror. And this is where the seeds are sowed of the Rudai organization. Because ultimately for Kaladi, uh, skinny Phil Lascalzo passes away. The, the, the faction of the family, that crew, is given to a guy called Joe Gambino. Okay, He's related to Tommy Gambino, those guys. They don't respect him at all, right? He's a he's a kind of a I wouldn't say weak individual, but he he's the Gambino part of the family that they don't engage in violence, right? The Tommy Gambino, the Joe Gambino. This is not the the Cherry Hill Gambinos. This is the other side of the family, the the sons of Carlo, right? Carlo's long gone. These guys are racketeers. Remember, Gotti's off the street by this point, and these guys, Rudy and Kalati, don't respect Joe Gambino. And that's made evidently clear down the road, but they decide we're going to go on our own, right? We're going to start doing our own shit. We don't care about the mafia anymore because the people that are in control of us, we don't respect. We look at them as below us anyway. So we're going to do our own thing. And that's exactly what Rudai does. Him and Kaladi start um, banding together uh, and they start recruiting. It's said that in the early 90s, Rudai and Kaladi allegedly recruit 30 or so people close to them. And this is a big makeup of Italians who were not in the mafia, Greek, and ethnic Albanians. You probably had some Montenegrins in there. This is a bunch of guys from the Balkans that are in the Bronx now. They're in crime. And they say, you know what? Let's see what we can't do here. Let's see if we can't make our own family out of this whole thing. And this would start a bunch of shit against the mafia. So it's Rudai, it's Kaladi, it's Prank Eva, uh, Evazai, Big Frankie, they called them. Uh, there was also a guy called Nicola Deadeye. He was involved. Uh, and what Rudai would also do is he recruits his cousin, Lusa Nukolovich. Now, Nukolovich is based out of Astoria, Queens. And this is also where <clears throat> they try to wrestle control out of the mafia. So, again, guys, it's not just the Bronx. It's not just Westchester County. The Bronx is definitely the fertile area, right? So when we're looking at this map, if you're on YouTube, and if you know anything about the Bronx, th this is essentially the northern-ish part of the Bronx, right? We're talking about, you know, Mars Park. Westchester, Pelham Park, Pelham Bay, that area. This is where these guys are moving in. And what they start doing is they start throwing slot machines. They start extorting people. They start loan sharking. They start gambling rackets. And they had plenty of gambling rackets. They had big bookmaking operations, ones that were making two, 300K a week in bets. These guys are starting to make big money. And remember, let's just say you have 50 machines. 100 machines you can make a shit ton of money so these guys are going they're going into areas where they don't respect the people that are there they're also establishing card games which is important as well because the mob obviously runs poker and and, and craps and gin rummy and all these different poker games they start going into these ethnically greek albanian areas and remember one thing about the mafia a lot of people don't realize is you go to astoria you go to the Bronx, you go to any of these places. A lot of these Greek card rooms and cafes are run by Greeks that are associates of the mafia, right? So let's say you go to Astoria. You may have five Greek cafes that are running car card games in the back, casinos in the back. They're all kicking up to members of the mafia. So again, this is all infringing on mafia territory. And these guys are saying, we don't give a hell. We are going to take what we want, and you're not going to do anything about it. Alex Ruda is starting to make his presence felt. Now, at one point, we would also start to see that they're engaging as well in straight up just assault. Uh, and we're going to get into that in just a second. What Ruda and his group also start doing is they start going into areas like Mount Vernon, which is very close and just outside of, let's just say, New York City, you know, directly north of the Bronx. And they start going in and establishing extortion rackets in places like Port Chester, Mount Vernon, uh, areas of Yonkers. 
they go into bars and just say, listen, dude, you're going to pay us or we're going to take your business. And that's exactly what they do. They would go into a bar uh, at one point, threaten the owner, beat him up a little bit, and um, he runs to the FBI. And this is a major problem because this is around 1999. For the last five or so years, this group is making their presence felt. They're making money. They're getting into things. This is the first time, and this is the problem for the Rudai organization, because they begin to start being way too showy, right? They're beating up innocent people. They're starting to do things that are rubbing people the wrong way. The mob knows you can't behave like this anymore. But they're just going into random areas and saying, hey, you work for us now. And this puts them on the radar of the FBI. And this is the start of it. Now, they also start becoming more and more brazen. It's alleged that in the early 2000s, they would slap around Bonanno Capo, Johnny Joe Spirito, which is pretty crazy because if you know anything about John Spirito, he's a pretty tough guy from what I understand. Now, this is something that's been reported by the FBI. This has been in indictments. Um, it also is alleged that in the early 2000s, Rudai had gotten sick and tired of Joe Gambino and they supposedly slapped him around, stripped him in the street, and stole his wallet as a sign of they got over on Joe Gambino. So, look, these guys are, are brazen. They don't care. They don't care about the title of the mafia. They're going at Bonanno guys. They're going at Gambino guys. They're infringing in Morris Park, Arthur Avenue. They don't care. And they're getting people like Pranka Evazai to do the dirty work. Nicola Deadeye, Lenny Kalati. But the thing about the Albanians that you have to remember is these guys all get their hands dirty, right? So if Rudai says, we're doing this, we're all doing this. And that's one thing about Albanians you have to remember. This goes from the teenagers on up. If one Albanian says, we're going here, I got to take care of something, 20 of them come with. And that's the thing about these guys. They all run in packs. They're a wolf pack, basically. It, 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 it's for them. A lot of these guys went through war, right? They're part of communism. They were in poverty stricken areas. They fight, right? They're tough. Not to say uh, the Italians aren't, but these guys didn't care, man. So they're setting up slot machines. They're doing their dirty work. They're beating people up. They're embarrassing people that you go embarrass and it's a problem. Now, what they also start doing is, as I said, Rudai has his cousin, Lusa Nikolovich. He's in Astoria, right? And he kind of starts realizing that Astoria is a very fertile ground for a lot of these Greek-run card games, Right? Which, remember, card games are big business, right? You, you have a card game five days a week. You got a lot of degenerates that want to play cards. And a lot of these ethnic people, whether they're Albanians, you know, uh, Bosnians, you know, Greeks, whoever, they want to play cards, right? So they start putting together operations. And a lot of these families in Astoria had Greek-based clubs that they were, that they were kicking up to the mafia. The Lucchese's had people. Uh, the Gambinos had people. So what Nukolovich, Rudai, and, and the corporation start doing is saying, we're going to now extend this into Astoria. Now, Pranka Evazai lived, uh, lived in Queens, or, or near Astoria. They get the idea, okay, we, we know and we have located seven or eight clubs. We're going to storm all of them, and we're going to take them all over. So what they do first is they hit a club – in June of 2001, called the Stamatis Club. Now, it's run by two Greeks uh, in, uh, in Astoria. Uh, their names are uh, Photius Diamopoulos and Antonius Balampanis. Now, remember, both of these guys, these Greek guys, are associates of the Lucchese crime family. Their clubs are kicking up to the mob. Rudai and the gang storm the club and beat and pistol whip both Greeks. Now, remember at this point, they're kicking up about $1,500 a week to Lucchese crime family. So they're kicking up about, you know, 6K a month. Remember, you have seven clubs, that's 
40, 50 K just from seven or eight spots that are doing barboot card games. Rudai says, that's mine. You're not having it. Uh, I'm going to take it over. Now, Rudai and the group are essentially striking up a group of card games called Barboot. Uh, it's a dice game that is very popular in Albania and the Balkans. Uh, and this is big money. I mean, at one point, there was a club in, in Astoria. They were making eight, ten grand a night playing Barboot in the back. So not only do they storm the Stabatis Club, but Rudai and the group in August 2001, alongside 15 of his associates, storm another club, a club called Soccer Fever, um, which was in direct competition with a game that they had put up already. Now, this game was run by this guy, Tommy Napoli, uh, a member of the Gambino crime family. He had a Greek running this card game. Uh, a person called Mikel Harakis. Now, on the first night of Soccer Fever, Gambino's club would bring in approximately $8,000, according uh, to the indictment. Now, the next night, Rudai and 14 other members of his crew would storm that club as well with guns and broke up the game. Now, the goal was to beat up Napoli, but he wasn't there. So they assaulted this guy Harakis instead. At one point... Alex Rudai would say to the group inside, quote, I don't want to see nobody here. If I see you here one more time, I swear to God, I beat you one by one. I eat you up. This place is closed. And that's exactly what happened. Soccer fever closed. Now, what we would find out is not only did they put that place out of business, but they took over several other clubs, including a club called Athenia on Newtown Avenue, just down the street from Stamatis Club, the Saloni Social Club on 30th Avenue, San Adisi on 31st Street, another club on 23rd Avenue, as well as an unidentified club on 30th Avenue and another on 23rd Avenue. So again, muscling in, brazen, and don't give at all a shit about whatever these families think. So remember, this is now three crime families, Lucchese's, the Gambinos, and the Bananos, that they are sticking their nose up at and saying, Bafangu, we don't care. We're going to take what we want. And we're also going to extort people. We're going to uh, start gambling operations. We're going to start loan checking. We're going to do whatever we want. And we're going to make millions of dollars. And that's exactly what Rudai and his group do. Now, by this point in the early 2000s, certain people are really starting to become annoyed with this group because they're saying, okay, they're doing a little bit, whatever. But you start storming my clubs, beating my people up. Now we have a problem. And you look at Tommy Napoli. I mean, he, you know, what's he going to do? 15 people run in his club. He's not even there. This is when Arnold Squitieri gets involved. Now, I've done a video on Arnold Squitieri. I think he's one of the more interesting people um, really in the early 2000s in the Gambino crime family. Essentially, Arnold Squitieri takes over the kind of the street runnings of the Gambino crime family in and around the early 2000s, right? 2001, 2002, uh, once Peter Gotti goes uh, to prison. Um, and by this point, you know, in 2001, 2002, Peter Gotti's not really on the street anyway. Um, he's doing a lot of stuff with, with, you know, uh, other things and Squitieri is, is kind of taking the family through tough times. He gets wind of what's going on with these Albanians. And according to Jack Garcia, who I've talked about on this channel, Jack Garcia is an FBI agent who would become Jack Falcone and infiltrate the Gambino crime family. He begins to get word that there was some sort of involvement between Arnold Squitieri setting up a meeting with Alex Rudai. Now, I want to tell you about what happened at this meeting. Okay, At one point, the two groups in the Albanians and Squitieri would meet at a gas station near the New Jersey Turnpike. Now, that group with the Gambinos had about 20 guys. They were all armed. Now, the Albanians only had six guys. They were also armed. 
At one point, Squitieri would tell them, quote, you took what you took and you ain't taking no more. There's going to be a problem. You understand. Now, Rudai with, would respond uh, to Squitieri uh, to essentially, if they start shooting at us, shoot the gas tanks and everybody would go. So, again, understand what we're talking about here. These guys are willing to blow the whole place up and die along with it because they don't give a shit. And I think that's the, the brazenness of Albanians, right? And we've heard that before, right? They don't care. Like, they'll, they'll blow the whole thing up. They don't care, right? They're not going to just hurt you. They're going to hurt your family, right? They don't care. Very brazen individuals. Now, ultimately, Rudai, even with the tough talk, um, would ultimately he realize that they have 20 guys, we only have six. Um, and look, if you know anything about Rudai and, and some of these Albanians, they had had been involved with the Gambinos at some point. So I think even with the fact that he didn't respect Joe Gambino, Rudai still had, I guess, some small amount of respect. And that they realized that they had to listen to reason or at least to Arnold Squitieri. Um, they weren't, they didn't have enough people there. Um, and I think this is probably the point where Rudai said, we have a little power here, but not as much as we think. And Squitieri did. I mean, Squitieri, they had powerful people everywhere. Ultimately, Rudai, even through the tough talk, they kind of, deaded things right they didn't want to go too much further than that they said you know what maybe we bit off a little bit more than we can chew but that wouldn't stop the brazen behavior and then they just start getting just kind of a little crazy but remember by this point you know they have a lot of money under their belt it's alleged that at one point while all this is going on they're still on lock making you know a lot of money i mean they're making Fifteen to thirty thousand a night in card games. Um, they had one bookmaking operation up in uh, Port Chester. It was making about three hundred thousand in bets per week. These guys are making big money. They're starting to acquire property. You look at uh, Kaladi and, and and Rudai. They're starting to buy property on Mars Park Avenue. They're they're starting to acquire things. Arthur Avenue. They're making inroads into these communities and starting to grow their wealth. Now, Rudai uh, eventually would do something pretty funny. Uh, at one point, one thing about Rudai is the Albanians had massive respect for John Gotti. They loved John Gotti. And in 2003, they would go to Rayo's, right, uh, East Harlem. Now, it's been a get big spot for gangsters. John Gotti loved it there. You know, we, we would know that through uh, Dom Sakali, that's where he would meet Vinny Bashiano at Rayo's. Um, gangsters love Rayo's. At one point, Rudai, alongside his counterparts, would sit at a table that John Gotti would sit at and demanded that that be their table going forward and that no one else sit there as a sign of we're here and this is our thing now. Kind of cringy, if we're being honest, but... They're planting their flag again. Now, if we know them at East Harlem, that's Genovese territory. These guys are, don't give a shit. They're just doing what they want to do. Um, now, again, they felt like this was a show of force, like a sign of respect. In the end, it was just kind of a, we're going to make ourselves so well known that we're putting ourselves on the map too much. Now, we would learn this in the 2010s, but at this point, in 2003 into 2004, the mafia is done dealing with these people, okay? And they're ready to just end it all away. According to an FBI memo, it's alleged that in 2004, high-ranking committee members of the Lucchese crime family had all their plans to completely eliminate this group. In fact, the memo would state that at one point, the Lucchese crime family essentially said they were ready to end this group once and for all. They bit off more than they could chew. And that's the truth. Lucchese family, the Gambino family, the Banana family, they were tired of these guys. 
right? Squitier had kind of made them look stupid. And they were making a little money, but then they're starting to run in people's clubs. They're just not respecting anything. They don't have any respect and honor. Now, what I've always found interesting about the Rudai organization is they attacked the mob really at, I wouldn't say that it's weakest point because the weakest point of the mafia is right now. But remember, in the early 2000s, they were they were all they were much weaker than they were, right? You look at if this happened in 1987, 1988, the mob would have wiped them off the planet, right? You know, Casa would have destroyed these people. But at this point, you have indictments. You know, you have the government breathing down the Lucchese family's neck, the Bonanno family's neck, the Gambino. Look at the Gambino. I mean, what were they gonna do? Peter Gotti just got indicted. Junior was in prison. You know, they're going through different guys. They still don't have the Sicilians kind of where they want to be yet. They're kind of in the, the, the kind of dysfunction. A lot of these families were messy. These guys definitely picked the right time, but they were attacking people that were weak, right? That they knew weren't going to do anything. I always found it interesting that the Ruda organization never actually went after the really powerful people in these families. You know, the some of the guys in the Bronx, right? The Lacasios, Campos, those guys. They never really went at those guys. But the Lucchese's were ready to wipe them out. The good thing for the Lucchese's was the Rudai organization ultimately did bit, bite off more than they could chew. And in 2004, Alex Rudai, alongside 21 others in the Rudai organization, are arrested and indicted by the federal government, alleging a massive racketeering enterprise that included, included extortion, assault, loan sharking, gambling, tax evasion, e everything involved running a racketeering conspiracy. Rudai is stamped out and everybody else is arrested too, including Lenny Kalati, Big Frankie Ivazai, uh, Lusa Nukolovich, Nikola Dedai, um, Fat Angelo Di Pietro, they're all picked up. And I probably think, again, we never will truly know, but we have to wonder, let's say the feds don't come down on the root organization. I feel like they had to because they didn't want a big war happening in the streets. It would have been interesting to see if the Lucchese crime family would have actually moved on these people, right? I think the government knew we got to get these guys off the street because they're going to be eliminated. Now, I'm sure Rudai's saying, F that. We'll, we'll go at them, too, you know. But we wouldn't really find out because that would be that. Ultimately, these guys would go to trial. And in four years, we would find out that just through gambling machines, the Rudai organization made over $4 million. These guys made millions of dollars doing what they were doing. They were buying up real estate. They were living pretty well. Not bad for a couple of Albanians and Greeks and, 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 and guys from the Balkans that come over to New York, see the mob making money and say, you know what? We're going to make our way in. And this would set up not just them. There have been dozens of people in the Bronx over the years. If you guys know anything about Joe Lika, right? Um, the Krasnikis in Staten Island. I mean, th these guys paved the way for a lot of these other Albanians to come in and start drug trafficking. Um, th these guys would spurn gangs. I mean, there have been all sorts of gangs that have run around Staten Island and the Bronx. Very feared people, right? And, and this is kind of the sowed seeds. Now, over in Europe, I mean, Albanians are the cream of the crop. The Albanians essentially run the cocaine distribution world in Albania now and, and are into other countries, the Netherlands, places like that. These guys are really powerful. Albanians have always been powerful. Now, for Alex Rudai and the group, all of these individuals would be found guilty and be given long prison sentences. I'm going to go through uh, those prison sentences now. Alex Rudai would ultimately be found guilty and be sentenced to 27 years in federal prison. He is currently 56 years old and is scheduled for release in November of 2027. And he is at Fort Dix Federal Correctional Institution in New Jersey. Lenny Kalati would also get 27 years. He is 61 years old and is scheduled for release in October of 2027. He is doing his time at the Federal Correctional Institute at Loretto in Pennsylvania. 
Pranka Big Frankie Evazai would get 22 years in federal prison. He is 57 years old and is scheduled for release in February of 2024. He is alongside his friend Alex Rudai at Fort Dix. Nicola Deadeye would get 26 years. He is looked at as kind of the enforcer of this group. Uh, he is 60 years old and is scheduled for release in July of 2027. He is doing his time at the Federal Correctional Institution at Danbury in Connecticut. Now, Lusa Nukolovich got a shorter prison sentence. He only got about 10 years or so. He was released in 2014. What he does now is unknown. I would have to think he is probably back in Europe somewhere. Who knows what he's up to nowadays? I really have no idea. I'd be fascinated to know. If anybody has any idea, let me know. Um, but I have no idea what he's doing at this point. Now, one thing we would find out, as usual, about the Albanians is they weren't done making news just yet. Um Lenny Kaladi and Pranka Ivazai would both uh, turn up as they were housed together in 2015 at FCI Danbury in Connecticut. Now, one thing about Danbury you have to understand is there is a large makeup of Albanians. There's a lot of gangsters in there. And something was going to kick off sooner or later. And the Albanians don't back down. The problem is... One thing I find out about the Albanians are they're always going after the weakest people. So what would happen is in 2015, March of 2015, a fight breaks out at Danbury in the rec room of that institution. And it involves Ivazai, Kaladi, and several other members of the Albanian group or Albanian associated people. They get into a fight with Colombo soldier Vito Gazzo, Michael Yanati, Michael Roccafort, Neil Lombardo, and Robert Lino. Now, Robert Lino is the Bonanno family. Lombardo, Yanati, and Roccafort are all Gambino guys. They get into a fight with the Albanians. Now, what this over is over allegedly is Kaladi and Ivazai allegedly beat up some sort of older non-Italian inmate who was friendly with the Italians. Now, no one actually saw what happened due to the fact that cells are not monitored, but I guess the individual is like an, a senior citizen and they beat him up and he had to go to the infirmary and he needed stitches and all sorts of stuff. So the Italian said, this is senseless. Who the fuck do these guys think they are? We're going to dole them out a beating. And that's exactly what Guzzo and the boys did. Uh, they beat these guys up, um, bloodied their nose. There, there were some issues. Now, everyone got thrown into the shoe. But again, this is a common theme with the corporation. If we notice, a lot of what they were doing is they were attacking gangsters who did not resort to violence or were more racketeers and older inmates that couldn't defend themselves. You look at Joe Gambino, the inmate in prison, um, these Greek guys that were associated. They're, they're not going to do anything to these people. Notice that when the Rudai Corporation had to stand up to real gangsters like Vito Guzzo, Vito cleaned their clock, okay? And notice in the streets, these guys didn't go after anyone of merit, right? They're targeting nobodies. They're making money. But when Squitieri called them to the carpet, they all backed down. Do I think they're a clear representation of Albanians? No, I don't. Real Albanians, like in Europe, total different animal here. Uh, and there's also even some New York guys, like Joe Lika, who's a, a, a lunatic. He put a hit out on Rudy Giuliani. We'll do a show on him at some point. Now, we haven't heard much from the Albanians recently. Uh, most of these guys have moved to different facilities, and they're all kind of separated at this point. Um, but they will, will get out. I mean, they're all scheduled for release. And, you know, I mean, Eva's I will be out next year, and the other guys will be out in, in, in you know, three or four years. So these guys are going to get out at some point. It'll be interesting to see what they do next. I mean, they're all in their, you know, they'll all be in their 60s to this point. 
Um, they're a lot different than, you know, let's say 20 years ago. I mean, these guys were in their 40s. But one thing we've found out about people that do crime, generally they go back to what they're known to do. So I have to admit I'm, I'm interested in it. We'll have to follow, we'll have to keep track of it. You know, Vito Guzzo will be out at some point as well. So who knows? You can't predict the future. But, you know, all these guys you know, have histories. They all know each other. Um, a lot of them don't like each other. And the Albanian community continues to get bigger and bigger. Now, the thing about Albanians like Italians is 90% of Albanians are good, hardworking people uh, that have businesses and, and real estate and, and have done very well for themselves. But it's a small number of individuals that decide, you know what, I don't want to do that. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm not going to do what you want to do. I'm going to do what I want to do. And you have people like the Rudai Corporation. Were they a sixth family? No. I think it was good for TV or for newspapers. But in the end, um, they made their money. They were too public. And they went to prison. And now they're going to have to give 25 plus years of their life to the federal government. So it remains to be seen what will happen next. But they are a part of history. It was a pretty interesting one in the early 2000s. As always, I hope you enjoyed the show. Do me a favor. Like I said, if you're on YouTube, make sure you hit that like button before you go. Let me know what you think of the show in the comments and make sure you subscribe so you never miss another sit down video. I, as always, want to thank all my audio fans as well. I appreciate everyone showing love to the podcast week after week. I'm always fascinated as to how well the show is done. And it's a credit to all of you. I truly appreciate it. And I know at times we have our fun. We go back and forth once in a while, but I love doing this and I'm happy we can bring it to you every week. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week here on The Sit Down.